Okay, a uh, very warm welcome to everyone for what is the third talk in this semester uh, of IITGN Dialogues. It's a seminar series that has been running uh, for years now. Uh, Professor Madhumita Sengupta is the convener of the series. Uh, my name is Orko Chattopadhyay. I teach in the humanities and social sciences here in IIT Gandhinagar. And I'm coordinating this particular talk of Professor Madhav Prasad. We are delighted to have him here with us. And a big thank you to everyone who has uh, come in in person for this talk and, and the, the crowd that we have online. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, Professor Madhav Prasad, for many of you may not need an introduction, and I don't mean this just as a formality or as a truism, uh, it's, it's a point of fact, but let me still do the honors. Uh, Professor Madhav Prasad has taught English film studies and cultural studies at several institutions in India and abroad, and retired recently after serving as Professor of Cultural Studies at the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. He's the author of Ideology of the Hindi Film, a historical construction, cine politics, film stars, and political existence in South Asia, in South India, sorry, and essays on literature, cinema, Indian society, and politics. Uh, Professor Prasad tells me he's been working on this particular uh, issue of language and language policy in relation to nation and democracy for a long time. And we're really glad to be able to hear him today. And his talk, is going to be titled The Federal Symptom, Language, Nation, Democracy. Over to you, Professor Prasad. Thank you. All right. Uh, hello there in the distance. Um, thank you, Arko, and uh, the organizers of this dialogue series for this opportunity. Uh, it is uh, a topic on which I have been working for quite some time and uh, putting out bits and pieces in uh, either orally or in written form or the you know, in different forms um, and uh, it has been uh, it has taken time for me to uh, sort of uh, develop for myself a kind of coherent picture of what the different aspects of this problem are. And so this is uh, one opportunity for me to uh, you know, further this uh, attempt of mine to, uh, to, to get a you know, map of the whole project because it involves a number of different aspects. Language is my starting point, as I will say in my, as I begin to speak, you'll know. Uh, but it leads to other considerations, other uh, problems, and they're all sort of interconnected. And so the sheer vastness of the problem has, has been a source of anxiety and uh, hesitation for me for a long time. Uh, so this is a good opportunity to, to try out some of these ideas, try a new organization of the uh, various uh, bits and pieces uh, and see if it works. And uh, I would welcome uh, any comments you may have, questions from which I can, uh, which, which I can use to improve this, uh, this uh, uh, piece of writing. Um, yeah, so the, uh, talk is titled The Federal Symptom, Language, Nation, uh, Democracy. And I will uh, just read out uh, uh, the text that I have uh, got, you know, written up, and I hope it'll be able, I'll be able to complete this in the time, say 40 minutes. Um, so let me start reading it out. Yeah. My presentation today will move between the cluster of four signifiers from the discourse of modern politics that feature in my title, Federalism, Language, Nation, Democracy, each of whose meanings is ineluctably dependent on the other three. If I have not included a fifth term, 
i.e. capitalism, in the title, it's because of its unique position in not being defined by its relation to the other four and constituting rather a defining, determining factor for all of them. Indeed, this will be part of the argument I will be making that part of the problem that we face in our political existence is due to the tendency to take each of these four as independently meaningful without considering the specific sense they acquire in this field in relation to these other terms. Without belaboring the obvious, I will just say for now that those who have learned the structuralist lesson well, for those who have learned the structuralist lesson well, such an assumption is no longer viable. In the research that has led me to this point, language has not been has be, language has been my point of entry and it was only in slow degrees and admittedly not fully that I've come to the realization of its connection to the other terms. Coincidentally, my work in this area has been more or less coeval with the advent of a capitalist society in the subcontinent. And accompanying this development, the signs of an impending overhaul of relations between the internal segments of the Republic. In a previous work, I presented a revisionist reading of a strand of cultural history, the phenomenon of film star politicians in South India, as symptomatic of a political formation cursed with a congenital identity crisis and leading to an informal skewed distribution of sovereignty from above which was a far cry from the distribution of sovereignty and message universally as the Republican ideal. In the virtual sovereignty formations around star figures, I read a compensatory development insofar as certain nationalities were deprived of real political existence in a Republican constitution imposed from above without consultation with the constituent parts. These nationalities equipped themselves with virtual sovereignties as long as other avenues were blocked until the advent of full-scale capitalism penetrating beyond the economic domain into the social fabric itself enabled the expression of national longings in most strident ways. So much so that today federalism has become a central focus of political debate even as fresh attempts are being made to shore up the preeminence of the center at any cost. But India's federalism is a curious thing. For some, it already exists. For others, it has never existed and is at best what Gandhi might have called a good idea, something to be achieved if possible, but as yet nowhere in sight. A quick scan of the recent contributions in the media show that both views are equally current and seem equally to be unaware of the existence of the other. In a fine introduction to the topic of Indian federalism, with an excellent review of literature published in the midst of an already raging debate, Louise Tillin begins by saying, federalism has enabled the expression and protection of diverse forms of belonging within India and has been central to the richness and resilience of India, India's democracy. In federal systems, at least two levels of government, in India's case, the center and the states, share in the task of governing, but have their own spheres of autonomy. An idea shared, multi-layered, an idea of shared multi-layered sovereignty. We face questions of balance between regional autonomy and authoritative political decision-making by the central government. Tillin highlights the unique post-partition situation in which India's contribution was drawn up, constitution, sorry, was drawn up and adopted. She also notes that in this era, other countries too were inclining towards strong central authority to steer national development plans. Thus, India adopted what she calls a heavily centralized order, which departed radically from earlier versions 
of a decentralized federal model in which the central government's role would have been restricted. So radical was the shift from the earlier model to the new highly centralized one that a necessary consequence followed. I quote again, the word federalism does not appear in the constitutional text. The fact of a dual polity the fact that there are you know, center and states, the two levels, the fact of that dual uh, polity uh, governed by state and central authorities was the extent to which it was federal, as Dr. B. R. Ambedkar explained. I, uh, citing again from Ambedkar, all federal systems, including the American, are placed in a tight mold of federalism. No matter what the circumstances, it cannot change its form and shape. It can never be unitary. On the other hand, India's draft constitution can be both unitary as well as federal, according to the requirements of time and circumstances. In normal times, it is framed to work as a federal system. But in times of war, it is so designed as to make it work as though it was a unitary system. Such a power of converting itself into a unitary state, no federation possesses. There's no example other than India of this. That's, um, this is one point of difference between the federation proposed by the draft constitution and all other federations we know of. Not a federation then. In designing this unique, unprecedented model of governance, India had introduced a flexibility which was meant for times of war, only in Ambedkar's opinion, for this distinction has never been strictly adhered to. We know what mischief the institution of governors and the co concurrent list, both colonial government innovations designed to ensure British preeminence and retained by the central government of free India is capable of. Leaving the word federal out of the constitution while introducing a distinction between normal time and time of war orally while introducing the draft to the Constituent Assembly effectively means that federalism is a matter of sentiment, not law. This is the beginning of the elaborate informal underside of the Constitution, which has functioned more effectively than the Constitution itself, given that not just the central governments, but a central social class has emerged and developed a class interest for which the informal arrangements are a vital source of sustenance. We know how the national state immunized itself under Nehru against the hurly-burly of politics, as Partha Chatterjee has uh, brilliantly elaborated in the book, The Nation and the Fragments, keeping the development planning apparatus safe from the interference of the legislatures at all levels. No, the word federation was not accidentally left out. It was eliminated in order to avoid litigation by state governments in its name. Thus, if Tillin, like others, continues to employ this term as if it named something real, it could be because there is no other readily available name for this arrangement. And there is a minimal conformity to the prevalent definition in the form of the two-layered state. Besides, the word is everywhere and the, the word is everywhere that is in discussions and books and articles ha have been and will be written about it, no matter whether it exists or not. And this accumulation of literature will give it that modicum of nominal existence, which will ensure that it will be debated until the end of the Republic even as new qualifiers are introduced in a seemingly futile attempt at better description. A diminished version of federalism, a quasi-federal system, cooperative federalism, etc., etc. Which incidentally, which, uh, uh, and incidentally, this uh, term cooperative federalism has been around for a long time, since the 50s. It's not something new as uh, even I, I, I was uh, under the impression that it was a fairly new, lately introduced term, but it has been it has been used f 
for greater ideological effect in in today's time than it was earlier it was a, it was a, an attempt by scholars to you know at better description that's what led to the invention of this term cooperative federalism now it has acquired ideological sort of uh, uses um etc uh, right now the confusion does not end here there is the other embarrassing fact that the constituents of the federation did not come together so much as they were held together to use granville austin's terms nor are the constituents that have emerged from negotiation and struggle since independence the same as those that were in existence at the time of adoption of the unitary federal constitution. That is, we've seen a series of changes in the constituents of the Indian Republic. There were first the princely states and various uh, uh, large provinces, you know, uh, which combined, you know, it was only in 1956, for instance, long after the constitution had been adopted, that the states as they are now exist uh, were created. So we are talking about, at least the, these people who talk about federalism, they're talking about a federalism, you know, which is, uh, which is not in, you know, sort of which doesn't relate to the same constituents, the segments, as the ones that were present at the time of, uh, you know, the uh, 1950. Um, so there have been a series of changes. 1953, there was uh, some change, and 56, finally, there was a reorganization, and subsequently, we've had several uh, new states being formed, etc. There's been a there's been a you know constant uh, expansion of the states. Yeah, so um, Tillin's decision to treat Indian federalism as a model in its own right, in spite of all these, she provides all the evidence against uh, the, you know, uh, against the uh, case of federalism. And yet she says uh, that she decides to treat Indian federalism as a model in its own right, seems to be prompted by an aversion to negative characterizations of countries of the South such as, you know, the negative characterizations such as quasi-federal, which she regards as condescending. So there is a, there's an, again, there's a moral uh, sort of justification for granting a unique federalism to India, because otherwise it would be, you know, uh, a kind of uh, injustice done by north to the south, something. It's not said in so many words, but that's implied in what she says. One reason why the term federation was eschewed by the constitution makers uh, could be that India was being conceived as a nation by the lawgivers. In an essay entitled India and Nation of Nations, the historian uh, Madhavan Palat, somewhat unusually for modern scholars, grabs the problem by the throat. He lays out all the difficulties encountered in conceiving India as a nation, especially the pressures from inside, from entities that regard themselves as nations also. A staunch Nehruvian, he remains committed to reconciling the two orders of nationhood as a necessity for the future of the Indian Republic. But he does not minimize the difficulties to be faced on that path. In, nine, in the nine years since that lecture, the difficulties have only grown in size and complexity. In principle, there's no reason why a federation cannot also be a nation. The United States and Germany are two examples of classic coming together federations. This is a, this is a, a Granville Austin's uh, distinction. The coming together federations and the holding together federations. Coming together is when 
the the federation is formed by voluntarily sort of entering into a pact as happened in the us or uh, germany for instance uh, holding together is when you know you decide that these will be together and then you establish federal principles uh, uh, two examples of class, classic coming together federations, which are also deemed by themselves and the world as nations. But the Indian instance is different insofar as here, many of the federating units, setting aside the question whether voluntary or coerced, are also strong claimants to the historical definition of nationhood which was not the case for any of the constituents of, uh, uh, well, maybe Texas, but any none of the constituents of the US, for instance, um, as opposed to the idea of a nation that will be built as we go along. A caveat needs to be entered here. At the time of independence, many of these nationalities were not as well unified as they are now. And indeed, they were in no position to speak speak with a single voice to claim national autonomy even in a federal setup. That is, they were, they were scattered among you know, different uh, you, you know, administrative units. For instance, if you take the example of, uh, you know, of Karnataka, it was, a part of it was in the Madras presidency, a part of it was in Bombay presidency, and another part of it was a princely state, uh, and another part of it was in the Nizam's Hyderabad state. So in that sense, they, there was no national sort of uh, the possibility of anybody speaking for this whatever nationality and making any claims. So it's not as if, you know, they were deprived of something. They are deprived of the right to speak because there was no established uh, right to speak at that point. There was, there was no coherent, no unity which could have enabled that, right? Their national awakening, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. At the time of independence, many of these nationalities were not as well unified as they are now, and indeed were in no position to speak with a single voice to claim national autonomy, even in a federal setup. In the first place, the territories they inhabited were divided up between one or two presidencies in addition to small and large princely states. Their national awakening was a recent development and had not yet reached a stage where they could mobilize the masses behind a national autonomy movement. Indeed, it ought to have been a primary responsibility of the center to nurture the nationalities to maturity, to incubate them until they became capable of autonomous uh, speech to, to develop a voice. Like a joint family which dissolves into a set of nuclear units unified by common interests and shared pasts. But the center developed interests of its own which clashed with the interests of the nationalities under its care. It sought to suppress them unmindful of the compelling force of national consciousness once introduced. So there is no doubt that the national consciousness was had been introduced and that nationalities were beginning to form. The only thing was that masses were not, because it was, there was, the literacy was very limited. And so the masses were not behind the more or less restricted literary sphere in which national these nationalities were elaborating their nationhood, right? We know the reasons cited for why the center acted in this unilateral way. At that, at that time in Indian history, in the wake of the violence of partition and perceived threats from external forces, the center was forced to assume powers overriding the internal demands for rational a reorganization of the provinces according to the then prevailing universal standard of nationality sovereignty. There is no reason to doubt that this was the case, but repression is repression whether the reasons are good or bad. 
and some consequences were bound to follow. The fact that 75 years after the inauguration of the Republic, many of the nationalities continue to feel insecure about their identity and status and persist in their struggles for greater autonomy is a sign that the problem is not one of good or bad leadership. Indeed, the informal nature of Indian federalism leaves it to the good sense of the rulers to ensure that the states do not feel shortchanged and grow restless. When governments at the center appear to be encroaching on states' autonomy, it's always the government of the moment that is blamed. But the persistence of the problems and the governments led by different and mutually hostile uh, political parties shows that something far more fundamental is involved. And a psychoanalysis of the Indian political body alone may be able to bring this into the open. The above discussion has hopefully shown that the history of independent India is fraught with terminological confusion, duplication of formal identities, overlapping sets, and other marks of disarray, repression and evasion, all of it resulting in political ill form. Political good health may consist in clarity regarding the form one inhabits, even if that is not the most desirable form. Whereas ill health is a sign of being unable to determine the precise nature of the form. Thus we may say, as we say of a human being, that she is a speaking subject, that a nation is a speaking entity. Being careful to avoid subjectivizing a collective, one can conduct an analysis of this entity, look for signifiers that bespeak a repressed truth. From the alphabet soup of the unconscious, then one must by carefully attending to the discourse of politics, elicit the signifiers that will lead us towards uh, uh, an understanding. It is in the colonial past that a powerful psychic dimension was added to the, our conceptions of independent existence. The desire for India, for instance, is to begin with a European desire, and early defenders of indigenous rights embraced this concept which was at that time entirely an abstract idea, which Europeans infused with their fantasies of reconnection with an ancient past. For the conquered, soon to be colonized, what remained was to learn to love the image in which one held an appeal for the other, to embody the fantasy. Regardless of what unfolded in the course of the freedom movement, this ide fix govern the actions of the leadership to an extent that has never been fully accounted for. This dialectic of desire is another indication of what colonization introduces of a subjective dimension into the objective processes of movement, struggle, and triumph. Defeat as well as triumph. Colonized lands are often also subject to a paradox of freedom which divides history and appears to be irresolvable. I am referring to the unresolved question as to when India got freedom in 1947 or in 1950. And what it means to choose one of these dates over the other. A similar problem also, uh, you know, uh, is, to, is uh, said to be the case with Bangladesh, two dates which, over which people fight. All this by way of suggesting that in a post-colony, social scientific considerations may not adequately account for all dimensions of our political existence. Now, let us now turn to the discourse of modern democracy and its close ties with the emergence of the nation form as an independent conception in Europe and elsewhere. A good way to approach this topic is through the social contract theories that proliferated in Europe in the 18th century, of which Rousseau's is among the most celebrated. In exchange for peace, security of life and property, human beings come together to constitute a polity by contract, by ceding some of their natural rights to, the, to a power they themselves create. Modern constitutionalism has its roots in models of this type. 
And today's universal political form, the nation state, may be said to derive from this early design. But there is an aspect of this relationship between past models and present realities whose significance is not always sufficiently appreciated. In its first presentation, the contracting parties seem to be a random set of human beings motivated by the desire for self-protection. The material equivalent of the abstract social contract is the modern constitution, which is a paradoxical document in that as citizens, we are all present and future generations assumed to have signed it and the provisions to apply to us, even if we have never declared our allegiance. But between the abstract modeling and the concrete drafting of texts of law, there is a gap where the question arises as to who exactly are the people who are thus forced into allegiance to a state. Catherine Malibu provides an answer to this question derived from Hegel's critique of social contract theory. Here is Malibu's, Malibu on Hegel, on Hegel's commentary on Rousseau. Hegel insists, she says, upon the inherent contradiction in the principle of the social contract, which he had already raised in the Jena lectures on the philosophy of spirit of uh, 1805-1806. One imagines, this is her quoting Hegel, one imagines the constitution of, a, of the general will as if all the citizens gathered together and deliberated, as if the plurality of voices made the general will, unquote, from Hegel. Continues, continue with the quote from Malibu. One imagines in this way the movement by which the individual ascends to the universal thanks to the negation of self. And yet the general will appears to the individual as an alien will, not as an expression of her own. So if the general will appears, first of all, to the individual, not as a realization of her individual will, but as a foreign or alien will, it is because the individual as such is the result and not the origin of the general will. And, as, and this is why she does not recognize herself in it. Rousseau's model assumes that individuals are signatories to the contract. Hegel is saying individuals come into existence only after the contract, right? The individual is assumed to pre-exist and to participate in the creation of a general will in contract theory. Hegel insists against this that if that was so, the individual would not feel alienated from the general will. But by thus reversing the relation between individual and general will, Hegel, quote, Malibu speaking, threatens to ruin Rousseau's entire theory, unquote, which is founded on the idea that the general will is a product of the union of individual wills. To clarify his point, Hegel turns to the role of language in the process. The contract in Rousseau's model remains purely formal unless a way is found to substantiate it, so to speak, with popular participation. The blind spot in Rousseau is revealed by the simple question, a very uh, straightforward, naive question, if you like. In what language is the contract written? This is question never occurred to Rousseau in all of this, um, you know. Um, in, in what language is the contract written? One of the more difficult problems, I'm quoting Malibu here again, that Hegel reproaches Rousseau for having left unresolved is that of knowing in which language the contract is worded. Rousseau neglects to specify the essential thing, that is, that the contract is, first of all, a linguistic act. Rousseau states the formula of the contract as if it were ready-made, issued straight from a universal philosophical language beyond any particularities belonging to a nation state, as if its idiomatic dimension were evaded from the outset. That is, this is to say that what is hidden passed over in silence is the moment of the access to sense, the access of the general will and consequently of the community to its own sense. The linguistic community then effectively precedes the political community. 
So it's not a new community being formed out of nothing. It is a, a pre-existing community which is giving itself a new set of laws, right? Language is always originally the expression of an impersonal social order that carries the individual beyond herself, meaning that language is the first social contract, preceding by right and in fact the second. So without the linguistic, the language as the contract, which already constitutes a community and is already something alien to them, right? In the sense that it does not belong to anybody, uh, so on. Without that prior moment, this next moment cannot follow. The linguistic community precedes the political community as a matter of necessity. It is this pre-existing community, not a random set of individuals, for no such random set can exist before the political contract that enters into a contract giving rise to the general will. Where no such community exists, there can still be laws by which people are compelled to live, but they are not laws of their own making, in the sense in which Rousseau means it. As in the instance of predatory or exploitative colonial rule, here we must pay attention to a dialectical reversal, a possible one, where a nation is declared to exist without the requisite criteria being met, the result need not only be chaos and disarray, it can also lead to attempts to ground the putative nation on another foundation, even while continuing efforts to fulfill the original condition of a language community by official diktat. We must also remember that India is in transition from the empire form to a modern political form in which the nation figures in one way or another, necessarily. The post-national condition is still a distant prospect. Political theory opines that national identities are based on race, religion, language, or history. But such a random list misses a crucial point. While other factors are mutually exchangeable, are, you know, one can change for the other. Language is not. A common language is the only stable foundation for a nation without which every other criterion falls, fails in establishing a, a secure identity. We must not forget to note here that the idea of a linguistic community preceding the political community, as argued by Hegel, relates to a process of coming into being of nation states at a time when capitalism was making inroads into and destroying the foundations of feudal society in Europe. So it, it, all those remarks must be assumed to you know, apply to a certain, uh, uh, a certain place and time, right? Uh, our, our situation is different. Hegel could not anticipate the worldwide circulation of the nation form the appeal it was to hold for regions of the world violently drawn into the capitalist economy as sources of raw material and labor. When these regions sought freedom from colonial slavery, they were no longer what they once might have been, whether former empires or small isolated regions, but already unified into larger units by the self-serving actions of the colonizing power. To be colonized is thus to be stripped of older political forms, to be rendered formless. There is no question of reviving the old forms because they have been ground to dust, irretrievably scrambled by the arbitrariness of colonial administrative methods. It's not until the colonized learn to adopt the forms proffered by the ruling power that real movements for freedom begin. It's by learning to desire what the master desires that the colonizer has a chance at identity and freedom. Desire then is the desire of the other. But initially, this desire involves alienation of adopting the ways of the colonizer or of rejecting wholesale anything that comes from the colonizer. So there's both the one and the other, although they are opposite, they're, they're both part of that process of alienation. Both these affirmative and negative forms of relating to the colonizer's desire involve alienation. 
this is a crucial point to remember. Indigenism, nativism is not free from the determining influence of the colonizer's desire. When we feel constrained to act either in conformity with or in marked opposition to the colonizer's desire, in both cases, our alienation is plainly manifest. For the colonized, there is no way back to a prior state and deeds performed in an alienated state continue to suspend the move towards freedom. The concept of separation, which forms a pair with alienation in uh, Lacanian psychoanalytic discourse, is that process of breaking away from the desire of the other, an action which necessarily involves assuming the imposed identity as one's own, accepting full responsibility for who or what one is. In India, matters are further complicated by the intervention of a European fantasy of ancient India as the homeland of the Aryans. India in European eyes was not so much a determinate territory, but an idea. It was this idea that was first imparted to those early native interlocutors. If we look at the engagement with the idea of India in the 19th century, what we see is that there is little evidence of a territorial conception of it, in it. Instead, the intelligentsia of each linguistic community, the Bengali, the Madrasi, etc., as they were known then, relates to the idea directly as it is proposed by the alien rulers. They learn to desire India, the desire of the other, without knowing what this object of desire amounts to in political terms. We learn to love India first, and then, like other colonized re regions, we also learn to love the nation form. We also learn to equate the one with the other. Let us leave this matter here, only, only remarking in conclusion that in a way we are still in that state of an compound alienation, turning and turn now to the question of democracy. A few paragraphs left. Is that okay? How is Indian democracy affected by Palat's nation of nations problem? In a capitalist nation state of the type that we derived above from Hegel's critique of Rousseau, the polity tends to get divided into the rich and the poor, with each sending its representatives to parliament to define, de defend their interests. In other words, it is a class society that comes into being. Of course, in every society, for historical reasons that need, we need not go into here, there will be what, are now, what we now refer to as minorities. Those who do not belong to the linguistic community or the majority community that preceded the political one. But the division into left and right, a characteristic of such societies, is a division of the majority not a division between a majority and a minority. Though, majority. though majoritarianism has been known to flourish in all kinds of situations, rare is the nation state where the primary political division is between a majority and a minority. India has proven to be just such a rare instance. This is not a new development. The extreme manifestations of this face-off in recent times should not obscure the fact that this vertical division of the polity is not an aberration, but a defining feature of the political entity that we have established or inherited. What we are witnessing now is only the inevitable culmination of a misplaced nation claim without theoretically legitimate foundations. In other words, a category mistake induced by an alienating desire. This is not to deny that there are genuine class interests now cluster, ar clustered around just such an arrangement, but to draw attention to an irreducible fantasy element at work in our calculations. We can now circle back to the question of federalism with which we began these ruminations. We have seen how scholars attempting to come to grips with the unique Indian political form go to great lengths to find apt descriptions for the prevailing relations between center and states, qualifying federalism with a series of adjectives. The absence of voluntary acts of enlistment is explained away by a descriptive differentiation between coming together and holding together, while apparently ignoring preemptive strikes by the center, as in the case of the institution of governors. 
that the void at the heart of the currently ongoing federalism debate, the disavowed absence, should lead to a fetishization of the Constitution is not surprising. But the work of global capitalism in stirring up this mix and throwing up new possibilities for states to rest autonomy is a matter that has yet to be yet to get its due as a factor in political change. Perhaps it's too early to undertake a reckoning, but there is no doubt, to my mind, that the confrontation between center and states today is at fever pitch. The idea of India in its post-secular avatar is fighting hard to preserve its preeminence in the face of strong and resilient demands for a thorough recasting of relations where the constituent units will themselves decide what kind of arrangement best suits the interests of all. A center of one's own seems to be the demand of the moment and the threat this poses to the entrenched interests of a separate center with unilateral decision-making powers is a serious one. Our first leaders, the early leaders, decided that the needs of coexistence of diverse populations overrode the demand for political existence within a democratic setup. Coexistence trumped political existence, that is citizenship at every level. Today, a perception has grown that coexistence must be for the mutual benefit of all and can only be assured by the terms of such an agreement being decided upon together. All tutelage to received opinion is a denial of political existence or existence in freedom. Let us not romanticize it. This is not some ultimate freedom that communists and anarchists dream of. It's the freedom that is grounded in the capitalist mode of production, a very historically specific idea of freedom, which has proved elusive for us until now. But capital has been let in by the front door, and it brings with it very material conceptions of equality and freedom. As Marx pointed out, the original equality is that between the buyer and seller in the market. The equality of capitalist democracy, the equality that capitalist democracy promises is but an expanded version of it, made possible by state subsidy, as it were. In this new climate, subjects are struggling to lay claim to their own bodies that had hitherto been the property of their families and communities. You know, in, in real life, you have the Hadia case, you know, as an example. In the cultural texts, there are many representations of this. The commodification of labor, the most important social work of capitalism, and still at an early stage in India, has inevitably led to the recentering of the lab laboring body as a possession of the laboring subject, the one who enters into contract with the owners of the means of production. It is this unfolding reality that's driving social change today and emboldening state governments, especially those with strong national identity claims of their own, to stand up to central pressure as never before. Today, the road ahead is hard to discern and seems bleak, but capitalism may yet succeed in creating conditions for the end of alienation. That is all it can do, create conducive conditions by destroying the old. Rebuilding, however, will be our responsibility. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Prasad. That was a very uh, elaborate and thought-provoking talk going at multiple levels. I have a few comments, but I'll not begin with that. Uh, questions from the floor? from students, especially if we could have questions from students first. Hello, sir. Hello. My name is Sarfaraz. So in, in a part of your lecture, you mentioned uh, social scientists may not be able to account all problems of like post-colonial democracy. So can you like elaborate it a bit uh, more, please? Social science. Uh... Uh, social science or scientists may not be able to account for all problems of you know right. post-colonial democracy. Yeah. I mean, so matters of the spirit, matters, you know, uh, certain ideological issues. I mean, of course, the divisions, the walls between the disciplines are not as, uh, you know, thick as they were in the past. But even now, I think in general, the even, the, you know, when sociologists take up the question of uh, 
ideology, for instance, is a different approach, I feel. And so I, I believe, you know, that bringing in certain psychoanalytic concepts, you know, helps us to get a grip on certain aspects of this because uh, unlike general processes of, uh, you know, economic uh, development and so on, uh, which of course do not have uh, maybe much scope for such, uh, you know, uh, treatment, uh, in the specifically in relation to colonial uh, histories, there is this element of, you know, this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, psyches in, uh, you know, confrontation, right? And the problems of uh, love and hate, aggression, and so on, which, you know, uh, Franz Fanon has, you know, talked about at length, right? And many, many, uh, many others have uh, spoken about at great length. So in that sense, that dimension is remains somewhat extraneous to social science concerns. 